to welcome Ada Warren, uh, who will talk about adaptive variational quantum algorithms for Gibbs state preparation. The stage is yours. All right, so uh, thank you. My name again is Warren, and I'm here to talk about yeah, adaptive variational uh, quantum algorithms, uh, algorithms for, among other things, Gibbs state preparation. I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech. Um, so just a quick outline. I'll start off by talking a little bit about quantum molecular simulations with BQEs. I'm sure that's not a particularly unfamiliar topic to this crowd. Um, before moving on to work we've done at Virginia Tech on adaptive problem-tailored BQEs, before moving on to uh, my own work on using these adaptive variational algorithms for state preparation. So first, a bit about quantum simulation with BQEs. I'm sure most everyone is familiar with this, but just in case anyone's unfamiliar. Uh, so how do we actually simulate uh, molecular systems on a quantum computer? Because initially, you know, at first glance, this isn't necessarily an obvious thing. Uh, the system to be simulated is some uh, electronic state in some continuous uh, infinite space. Meanwhile, the system that we want to represent it on is some quantum computer, some, you know, for instance, superconducting chip consisting of qubits, which we perform gates on. So the uh, first step in moving to an actual quantum computer with these systems is to move to a representation of the problem, which is sort of, minim sort of more amenable to a uh, representation on a quantum computer. And so for this, we can use second quantized states. Basically, we start by choosing some complete set of single particle orbitals. Uh, in principle, it doesn't really matter which states you choose, but in actuality, you're going to truncate the number of states that you'll represent so that you can actually fit it on a quantum computer. So the choice is rather important. And then instead of keeping track of position space wave functions, we will instead keep track of single particle occupation numbers. Because these are fermions, the largest occupation will always be one. So we end up with states that look like bit strings. And already it sort of looks more like something that we can represent on a quantum computer. Once we have these states, we next introduce a set of creation and annihilation operators for each operator, keeping in mind that these electrons are identical fermions. And so these operators need to obey the appropriate anti commutation relations. Uh, and then once we have these creation and annihilation operators, we can re-express the Hamiltonian or any other observable of interest in terms of these new operators, uh, uh, which these, these prefactors here can be represented, can be computed classically. For a Hamiltonian for realistic molecular systems, we only need these one and two body operators. And then once we've moved to the second quantized picture, we need to actually do the work of mapping the, these problems onto a quantum computer. There are a number of choices for doing this, but one uh, very common and in some sense the simplest mapping is uh, the jordan Wigner mapping. For this, we associate one qubit with each of the single particle states that we're going to be sort of uh, working with. And we'll make the very simple identification that for unoccupied states, the qubit will be in state zero. And for the occupied states, the qubit will be in state one. Next, we need to start worrying about the operators. So uh, because of the representation we've chosen, it's sort of obvious that we need to map these creation and annihilation operators onto qubit raising and lowering operators. But we also need to be careful to preserve uh, the uh, anti-commutation relations because, the, again, the, these are identical fermions. And we do that with these Z strings. Um, this makes it sort of expensive to compute these operators on real quantum computers in terms of the number of CNOTs required because these are sort of highly entangling operators, but it does work. And so with this mapping, now we have a way of actually representing our molecular electronic states and operators with states and operators on our quantum computer. So once we have a way of representing these uh, states and, and working with them, we can start asking about quantum simulation of these systems. Uh, one very common question that we ask about is, is what are the spectra of these uh, molecules, for instance? Um, and an algorithm which has been developed for this is the variational quantum eigensolver. So this is based on the variational principle, which says that for any state, the expectation of value of the Hamiltonian with respect to that state will always be bounded below by the ground state. And so by minimizing this expectation value, we can form an upper bound on that uh, ground state energy. And if we can actually get sufficiently close to that ground state energy, we can actually uh, prepare essentially the ground state itself. So the VQE is a, a classical quantum hybrid algorithm where we have a quantum computer, which is used to execute a circuit with some classical parameters to prepare some parameterized state. 
And then we do measurements of, on that state to compute expectation values of the Hamiltonian. That information is then sent to a classical computer, which then uh, optimizes these classical parameters to obtain an upper bound on the ground state energy. And if we get close enough, uh, essentially prepare the ground state itself. So obviously the center pin of this whole algorithm is the classically minimized objective function for VQEs, typically the energy. And so this objective function really only depends on two things. There's the observable measure, uh, which is the Hamiltonian and the ansatz used, the actual parameterization of the wave function that we're going to optimize. The Hamiltonian, you know, there's not really much we can do with, it's sort of just a part of the problem statement. So any, any approach we wanna to take to sort of improve the performance of this algorithm needs to focus on the ansatz itself. So what ansatz do we use for VQE? There are a couple of ansatz which are very common in the literature. Um, the first of which is the hardware efficient ansatz. So this is an ansatz which is sort of tailored to our chosen platform and uses operators sort of native to our platform. Uh, there are a number of experience, uh, experiments using this hardware efficient ansatz. For instance, uh, these results from the uh, IBM group by Kandala et al showing in a superconducting platform consisting of six qubits, they were able to uh, compute dissociation curves to varying degrees of accuracy for H2, lithium hydride, and beryllium hydride. And these ansatz that consisted of an alternating gate structure of single qubit gates uh, layered between these uh, sort of entangling gates, which are native to this superconducting platform. The, single, the, the entangling gates are actually sort of fixed, again, being chosen to be uh, very simple to execute on these platforms. And then all of the optimized parameters come from these angles on the single qubit uh, rotations. And so this is an effective way of computing these uh, dissociation curves, at least for small molecules. However, there are a number of issues with this uh, hardware efficient ansatz. In particular, it's fairly inefficient in terms of the way it explores Hilbert space because this hardware efficient ansatz is really in no way related to the problem we're trying to solve. Every time we apply it, we tend to get shot off into some distant part of Hilbert space, which is fairly far away from the ground state they're actually trying to prepare. And this is especially problematic in larger systems because uh, it's well known that in these larger systems, the uh, Hamiltonian displays a large number of, of barren plateaus, basically large regions of, uh, regions of parameter space where the expectation value is very flat and the gradients are very close to zero, making it uh, sort of exponentially difficult to uh, create ansatz which are, are good for optimizing and can actually get us to the ground state. So another approach to VQEs, which tries to sort of sidestep this problem are uh, chemistry inspired ansatza, for instance, uh, unitary coupled cluster. This is a generalization of more sort of classical approaches to the same problem. The basic structure of these unitary coupled cluster uh, ansatza is we have some a uh, UCC gate, which is generated by this T operator here, which consists of terms which uh, preserve things like particle and uh, spin symmetry. Um, in UCC SD for singles and doubles, we only include these first two terms consisting of uh, one and two body operators, but in general, you could add more. And then these uh, parameters multiplying these one and two body operators end up being the actual uh, parameters that are optimized for our ansatz. Of course, to actually implement these gates on quantum hardware, we, we generically can't implement this gate directly. So what we need to do is to trotterize, break, break these, uh, this, this operator up into terms which can be applied directly on hardware and then apply them in a layered structure to obtain sort of an approximation of this UCC gate. So this probably has seen the most attention in actual experiments and has been adapted to a large number of platforms. So uh, for instance, Peruso et al were able to adapt this to photonic qubits. And this was actually the very first uh, real life VQE experiment on um, helium hydride uh, molecule. Since then it's been adapted to, for instance, superconducting platforms, trapped ion qubits and uh, spin based qubits most recently. So this result from Ju et al came uh, earlier this year. And this was actually sort of the first time 
that uh, spin qubit platform was able to uh, be brought close to the fault tolerance threshold. So that was a fairly exciting result. But these UCC on SATSA are not without their own problems. Um, while they are fairly efficient in terms of exploring the problem space, because of this trotterization that we have to do, they end up creating impractically long circuits, which is uh, particularly problematic in this era of noisy quantum computers where we have very limited coherence time. Another issue is the actual trotterization that we use. In principle, if we took it to the infinite limit, obviously it doesn't matter uh, how we trotterize, but we can't go to the infinite limit because again, we have very limited coherence time. And under low order trotterization, uh, we were able to show that the uh, results you get are actually inconsistent depending on how you arrange your trotterization. It really does matter how you trotterize and there's no sort of principled way of, of determining how exactly you should do it. And the real problem that sort of both of these ansatsa are running up against is that neither is problem tailored both to, to the full problem, both to the actual chemistry nature of the problem that we're trying to solve and to the fact that we're trying to represent this on a real quantum computer with you know, all of the uh, problems associated with those, especially regarding noise. So what can we do? So uh, what, what exactly makes for a good ansatz? So a good variational ansatz should span the actual target space. It should be able to, to uh, prepare the ground states that we're interested in. It should do so using only shallow circuits so that we uh, can make full use of the limited coherence time we have. And it should do so ideally using uh, not too many classical parameters or it becomes fairly difficult to optimize on the classical side. And going along with that, it should also uh, provide for an onslaught which does not have too many local minima or barren plateaus in the expectation value, again, to uh, make it easier to optimize classically. And it turns out this is a very difficult set of goals to achieve with the generic onslaughts. So at Virginia Tech, we have taken a sort of different approach to these VQEs by using adaptive problem tailored VQEs. So the main uh, algorithm that we've used in this regard is called adapt VQE. And the basic idea of adapt VQE is instead of choosing some sort of fixed on sots up front, we will instead uh, choose up front some pool of available operators and some initial reference state. And then we will iter iteratively construct this on sots by applying unitaries generated by pools in the operator one by one to that reference state in this sort of pseudo trotter form. So how do we actually choose the operators that we uh, are using to build this on uh, Basically at each iterative step on the, of the algorithm, we choose operators based on a gradient criterion. So uh, basically we go through the pool and for each operator in the pool, we ask, okay, so if we added that operator to our on what would the gradient of the uh, expectation value of the energy be with respect to the newly added parameter. And it turns out uh, you can show fairly easily that this uh, gradient can be easily measured in terms of a new uh, Aramitian operator on our quantum hardware. And so we go through the pool, compute all of these gradients, and then select the operator with the largest gradient to add to our onsets, and then do a full fixed BQE reoptimization. So here is everything I just said sort of in uh, diagram form. We start with some initial state, typically the Hartree-Fox state closest to the ground state. Uh, starting from that initial state, we prepare the best state we've sound, found so far in the iterative problem. We measure all of the gradients for uh, all of the operators in the pool. If all of those gradients are sufficiently small, we uh, assume that we've converged to the actual ground state and say we're done. If there are gradients, however, which are sufficiently large that we know we haven't converged, we choose the operator with the largest gradient and then use that to grow our onsets with an initial uh, parameter of zero. And then again, do a full VQE, fixed onsets VQE to re-optimize all parameters and then just go through the uh, loop again and again until eventually we do reach convergence. So if we look at the performance of this algorithm versus other sort of pseudo trotter type algorithms, the uh, blue and orange curves here are using that ADAPT procedure. This uh, 
purple and, and brown curves are essentially using the exact same operator pool, but constructing these ansatz in a random manner instead. And then these uh, red and green curves are essentially um, using the same operator pool, but this time applying the operators in lexical order based on which uh, orbitals they actually um, affect. Meanwhile, this blue dot is UCC SD. And you can see that while all of these approaches are ultimately capable of reaching chemical accuracy, this ADAPT procedure is able to do so using far fewer parameters. So it's able to do so very quickly and very efficiently. One question that you might ask about that is, is how does this uh, procedure work regarding trainability? So by construction, ADAPT produces very compact problem tailored on SATA. That was the whole goal. But as a result, the, the circuits that it produces are fairly shallow. And it's a well-known issue that very shallow circuits generally uh, exist in very rugged landscapes with lots of uh, local minima. So we can ask, you know, it's reasonable to ask if, if ADAPT suffers from this problem because of these rugged landscapes. So over here, we have some numerical results. This green curve here uh, is showing basically the ADAPT procedure where at each step we construct these onsets and we use as our initial parameters for the VQE, the uh, most recently found best parameters according to the last VQE. Meanwhile, this, this cloud of results here is essentially using the exact same onsets, but now uh, reinitializing at each step with totally random parameters. And so these are sort of the best uh, final states found using that random initialization. And you can see that, yes, in fact, the, the landscape is very rough. Uh, and lots of these uh, random initializations get caught in local minima, very far above the actual ground state. But using the ADAPT procedure, we're able to stick very close to the bottom of this cloud uh, and thus stay, um, basically get very good performance with uh, very low errors. This blue curve, meanwhile, is, is, is just taking the best result from all of these random initializations. And you can see that the ADAPT uh, procedure tracks very closely without requiring doing tons and tons of random initializations to find the best procedure. So ADAPT does seem to be able to avoid the issues associated with trainability that come from very shallow circuits. And we also have numerical results showing that this ADAPT procedure, uh, because of these shallow circuits, is resistant to barren plateaus. So we're not getting struck in, stuck in these regions with very low gradients. So ADAPT seems to be a very uh, good algorithm for finding these, these uh, molecular ground states. And once we have this ADAPT VQ procedure, there are many uh, generalizations that we can make, questions that we can ask about how to improve this algorithm further. So one question that we can ask, all of the results I've shown so far have been based on these UCCSD-like uh, molecular, or sorry, uh, fermionic operators. But we can ask instead, you know, maybe we can form a pool made out of more hardware efficient on operators, going back to something more like the hardware efficient on SATSA. So here we have some results from a modified protocol called Qubit Adapt DQE. This is the work primarily of graduate students uh, Holan Tang and uh, Vlad Shkolnikov, where Basically, it's the same thing as ADAPT, but now instead of these fermionic operators, we have a pool consisting of uh, Pauli strings, which act on up to four different qubits at once. And so here are numerical results for uh, running this qubit ADAPT uh, procedure on H4, lithium hydride, and H6. This top set of graphs shows essentially the number of classical parameters that we need to introduce. The blue curve here is a qubit adapt, and the, the red curve here is regular adapt. And so you can see in terms of the number of parameters that we're introducing, because these are much simpler operators with much lower expressibility, we do need quite a few more operators and quite a few more uh, trainable parameters. However, because these are so much simpler operators, each one of which requires uh, fewer CNOTs, even though we have to add more of them, the total number of CNOTs to realize this onsets and to reach chemical accuracy is much lower than standard ADAPT, either applying it in the most naive way or sort of transpiling it to get some CNOT savings uh, by being a little bit more clever about how we apply the gates. 
So the qubit adapt VQE procedure is able to save pretty considerably on the number of CNOTs. Another direction we can move in is, uh, you know, typically when we do these molecular simulations, we tend to work in a sort of gate-based quantum computing model, building circuits out of gates. But ultimately, when we go to apply this on a quantum computer, uh, we don't apply, you know, sort of abstract gates. We compile those gates into a set of pulses, which then get applied to the qubits in our quantum computer. So instead of working with that gate-based model, we can ask, is there a way that we can use these adaptive procedures to optimize the, uh, the pulses that we send into the computer directly? So that procedure uh, has been developed as control VQE. The basic idea here is that we take these pulses and we divide them into several discrete sort of slices um, and optimize uh, not any gates, but actually the um, the amplitude of the pulses for each time slice. So here we have a set of results using this uh, control BQE procedure. First for uh, H2, this, this uh, shows the uh, level of uh, the, basically the dissociation curve for H2, but we have other results for helium hydride and lithium hydride. And you can see here uh, for all of these molecules, um, Control VQE is able to ultimately reach an energy which is assist, uh, essentially in, or, uh, indistinguishable from uh, doing the FCI calculation. So we are reaching the ground state essentially. And then over here on the right, this is basically just showing that uh, as we increase the number of time segments that we're optimizing, we approach chemical accuracy and ultimately the ground state uh, sort of monotonically. And so we can get a sense uh, not only of how well we're doing, but what kind of savings we're getting by taking the operators uh, constructed by this control VQE procedure and sort of reverse compiling them back to a gate-based model using, for instance, UCCSD. And so what we find, for example, is that for lithium hydride, using that sort of reverse compiled uh, circuit, were we to use UCCSD to realize that ultimate gate, we would require something like 80,000 nanoseconds of uh, coherence time. Meanwhile, control VQE, because we're abandoning this circuit model, is able to reach the exact same gate in only 50 nanoseconds. So we're seeing something like three orders of magnitude improvement in the amount of coherence time required. Uh, more recently, doing some further work on control VQE, uh, we were able to show you know, one, one major sort of disadvantage of the uh, circuit-based model the gates that we're applying uh, always work within some predefined qubit uh, space. Obviously, we don't want our gates to take us outside of this qubit subspace. However, uh, control v uh, VQE is able to make use of additional excited states outside of the qubit space. So we can move outside of the qubit space to do part of our computation before moving back into our qubit space ultimately. And we were able to show that using these uh, excited states, can considerably speed up the evolution uh, towards the actual ground state. Additionally, as we restrict the total pulse time that we allow this control VQE procedure to utilize, we find that ultimately the, the pulses generated converge to a sort of bang-bang-like protocol where we are always uh, either at the maximum or minimum uh, amplitudes that we allow control VQE to use, which can sort of realistically be utilized on our quantum computer. And so the Pontryagin maximum principle basically shows that bang-bang solutions are always sort of the most optimal for preparing these states. So we are approaching sort of optimal control as we uh, reduce the uh, time that we allow the control DQE procedure to use. And then we find that below a certain evolution time restriction, there simply is no solution. So by using control VQE, it seems that we actually can approach sort of the, the most optimal way of preparing these molecular ground states. And these results are all for H2, but we have other results for other, uh, um, other molecules. So there are a number of, of ways of improving on these ADAPT VQE procedures. Um, a few I haven't mentioned, for instance, are ADAPT QAOA, which is using more numerical uh, optimization, so solving things like max cut problems in graph states. Um, but for now, I'll move on to my own work, along with postdoc Ling Wajiu, on adaptive variational quantum algorithms for Gibbs state preparation. 
So a bit of background on Gibbs state preparation. The basic problem statement is we're given some Hamiltonian H, which acts on some data system D consisting of N D qubits. And in this data system, we want to prepare no longer some pure ground state, but a mixed thermal state at arbitrary temperature T. This has many useful applications in quantum simulation, quantum machine learning, quantum optimization, and several others. But in general, it's a very hard problem. It's expected to be at least as hard as uh, ground state preparation itself, especially given that as we approach uh, temperature T equals zero, this essentially becomes identical to ground state preparation. So there are numerous ways in the literature that people have tried to approach this problem. Uh, one very promising approach for its potential applications on near-term noisy devices is variational Gibbs state preparation. So this has seen uh, several approaches, uh, particularly the Swoo and Shea paper will become important later. The basic idea here is that in addition to our data system D, we introduce a new purifying and filling system A with N sub A qubits. And instead of just preparing the data system in some state, we're going to prepare a classically parameterized pure state in the combined data ancilla system. And then if we restrict our attention to just the data system and trace out the ancilla system, we, uh, this gives us a way of preparing a uh, classically parameterized mixed state in the data system. So then by optimizing these uh, classical parameters to minimize no longer the system energy, but the Gibbs free energy, we have a method of preparing the Gibbs state since the Gibbs state is exactly that state which minimizes this Gibbs free energy. However, there are a number of problems which arise when we uh, consider this approach. Two really major concerns. Uh, first of all, just like for ground state VQEs, it's very difficult to know a priori what will make for uh, an efficient, effective onslaught for Gibbs state preparation. And then sort of more concerning even than that, um, measuring the von Neumann entropy and its gradients is very difficult on real hardware. Even sort of the best known algorithms scale exponentially with the number of qubits in our system, sort of wiping out any quantum advantage that we could hope to realize. Uh, and thus measuring the Gibbs free energy itself is, is basically intractable for large problems. So thinking about this second problem first, one way to sidestep this is to no longer measure the Gibbs free energy, but to find a different objective function. So in our uh, paper, we were able to find um, a new objective function, which works. Here it is. It's essentially the, uh, the Hilbert Schmidt distance between our prepared state rho and the actual exact Gibbs state at our desired temperature rho sub g. So uh, it's easy to show that this is an objective function which is still minimized by the exact Gibbs state, but now it depends not on any kind of entropy, but only on the expectation value of some Hermitian operator, as well as the purity of the state that we produced, both of which are, are fairly easy to measure on real quantum hardware. Now, one obvious flaw you might see with that approach, um, measuring this full objective function as written here does require full knowledge of the very Gibbs state that we're trying to prepare. So, you know, on its face, that doesn't appear to be a very easy thing to measure since it requires solving the problem, it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. Uh, but we found at least numerically that we can uh, approximate this objective function using a truncated Taylor expansion of this Gibbs state. Um, and that still gives us an objective function, which is much easier to measure, but which still works fairly well for preparing these Gibbs states. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. Finally, what this objective function allows us to do, there are various methods, for instance, per parameter shift rules for measuring exact gradients of the expectation impurity, rather than resorting to things like uh, numerical methods, such as uh, finite uh, difference methods. And this gives us a, a very good principled way of adding operators to our onslaughts and for optimizing, similar to tricks that we can use in regular adapt VQE. So now moving back to that first problem of how do we find a good onslaughts, you know, we've been working on uh, adaptive variational algorithms, so we can try that. Uh, we actually came up with two different protocols for adaptive uh, variational Gibbs state preparation. 
The first of which we're calling ADAPT VQE Gibbs because this is sort of most like the ADAPT VQE algorithm that I've been talking about uh, before. So the idea behind ADAPT VQE Gibbs, we start with an ancilla system, which can actually be of any size. So uh, in particular, when the nature of the problem allows for smaller ancilla systems than uh, the data system that we're using, this can allow for considerable quantum resource savings, allowing us to use much fewer qubits on our quantum computer. Though it is fairly easy to see that at large temperatures, um, we do need an ancilla system, which is just as large as our data system. So these resource savings really only apply in very low temperature limits. However, low temperatures are generally sort of the most interesting uh, regions for these Gibbs state preparations in terms of other problems we can solve with them. Higher temperatures, there exist many methods for uh, computing these, these Gibbs states fairly efficiently. Lower temperatures are a lot harder. So as far as our uh, variational operator pool, we chose sort of just the simplest pool, which is capable of expressing the states we're interested in. So we chose an operator pool consisting of all one and two qubit pallies acting on our combined data ancilla system. One sort of caveat with choosing this pool along with the objective function that we've chosen um, is that the pool requires that our initial state won't be uh, partially entangled. It's fairly easy to show that if our initial state is uh, totally unentangled between the data and ancilla systems, the largest gradient will always come from an operator in the pool, which is local to the data system. And so we will never move out of that uh, initially unentangled condition. And you can show similar results for the uh, for maximally, maximally entangled states. So neither unentangled or maximally entangled states make for very good starting states. Uh, and instead, what we need is something partially entangled. There are quite a few ways to do this that work. One that we found works fairly well in general is, is something like this. This is maybe not the most efficient way of approaching the problem. But we found that it works fairly well. Essentially, what we do is we apply um, random, uh, non-optimized random rotations to each of our qubits, followed by C naughts between each uh, qubit in our data system and each qubit in our ancilla system to generate the actual entanglement between the, those two systems. And then once we have that initial uh, partially entangled state, just like the original ADAPT VQE al algorithm, we can use a sort of gradient criterion based on gradients of our new objective function to select uh, the operators that we use in our onsets and build that onsets iteratively. Um, one issue that might arise because of this initial state that we sort of have this random rotation in, uh, and because these are non-optimized parameters, we can try optimizing them, but generically we find that um, we, we tend to get stuck in local minima and no longer reach the actual Gibbs state. So because of these initial non-optimized parameters, which are randomly chosen, it's possible that we make a bad choice in those initial parameters and, and don't actually converge to the Gibbs state. But to guard against this, we can simply run the algorithm several times with several different initializations, and then post-select at the end, the best performing onsets to find the true Gibbs state. So to test the efficacy of this algorithm, we looked at a couple of different trial Hamiltonians. Basically, both of them are uh, periodic spin one half uh, chains. The first of which is a ZZ coupled icing chain. And the second being uh, this XY chain using XX and YY operators between adjacent qubits, uh, sort of arranged in a ring. And so looking at the actual performance of ADAPT VQE with these different Hamiltonians, um, this top graph here, these top graphs here show the uh, ultimate fidelity that we're able to reach post selecting over uh, 10 different random initializations uh, with respect to the exact Gibbs state. So up here we have the performance uh, we, for all of these results, we have uh, four qubits in our data system and we're choosing such a small system essentially because of the difficulty of simulating these on uh, classical hardware. Um, when we don't restrict the number of ancilla and we choose an ancilla system, which is exactly equal to our data system. We see that we're able to consistently reach uh, perfect or near perfect fidelities with respect to the exact Gibbs state. However, again, ADAPT DQE Gibbs allows us to choose ancilla systems of essentially any size. And so if we restrict that ancilla system further um, to smaller systems, 
uh, at very low temperatures, we find that we are still able to reach very high fidelities um, in excess of say 99% at low temperatures. At higher temperatures, we're no longer reaching very high fidelities rel uh, relative to the exact Gibbs state. However, the solid lines here are showing essentially the largest fidelity that it is possible to reach with these uh, restricted size ancilla systems. And so we can see that while that PQE Gibbs is not finding perfect fidelity at these larger temperatures, it is still saturating the upper bound of what is possible to realize um, using these restricted ancilla systems. On the bottom here, we have the number of C-naughts required to realize the final states shown in the top graphs. This dashed line is the number of C-naughts required to realize that on thoughts from the Wu and Shea paper that I mentioned earlier. Um, and this, this dashed line is actually the number of C-naughts required to realize uh, these, these, uh, this Wu and Shea uh, on thoughts at the very low temperatures, where again, things are sort of most interesting. At higher temperatures, the algorithm actually does even better than this uh, dashed line would suggest. But we find that for the periodic XY Hamiltonian in low temperatures, where it's, this, is sort of, uh, this problem is sort of most interesting, we are able to reach uh, near perfect fidelity, even for uh, systems of ancilla, ancilla systems equal to our data systems, uh, which actually beats this Wu and Shea procedure, even for you know, largest systems. Um, for the Ising Hamiltonian, there actually exists a sort of optimization uh, in Wu and Shea's approach that allows them to get away with fewer C naughts. So, in that case, they do sort of beat us uh, in terms of these larger ancilla systems. However, because we're able to make use of fewer, uh, uh, smaller ancilla systems, um, we see that uh, at low temperatures where these smaller ancilla systems are capable of reaching very high fidelities, we are actually still able to beat them while reaching very good fidelities. So this ADAPT EQE Gibbs is able to beat uh, several different um, current approaches to uh, BQE preparation. I'm focusing here on the Wu and Shea example because it's sort of one of the best ones that we found so far. Uh, but it's not able to do very well at high temperatures. At high temperatures, we're doing quite a bit worse than uh, Wu and Shea's approach, which again, their approach actually does better than this dashed line would suggest at high temperatures. And while it's true that these low temperatures are sort of the most interesting regions, uh, high temperatures are not exactly uninteresting. So we wanted to you know, see further if there were any approaches that we could use that might perform better at these high temperatures. Um, uh, and so the way we did that is with the second protocol that I'll talk about, ADAPT, which we're calling ADAPT QAOA Gibbs. And this basically incorporates elements of Wu and Shea's approach, which is based on uh, QAOA, which again it, it are these sort of um, sort of uh, problems for solving classical numerical optimization problems like max cut on graphs. Uh, we actually have another protocol that I sort of mentioned before called ADAPT QAOA, which uh, is also using this sort of adaptive procedure to solve these numerical problems. And so we were able to incorporate uh, elements of Wu and Shea's approach into a QAOA-like protocol uh, for Gibbs state preparation. So for this second algorithm, um, much like Wu and Shea's approach, we're going to choose an ancilla system now, which is equal in size to our data system. So there's no uh, avenue for quantum resource savings at low temperatures, but again, this uh, algorithm is sort of most interesting and performs best at high temperatures where you need a larger uh, ancilla system anyway. And so we're going to start with an ancilla system equal in size to the data system. And then we're going to start in a maximally entangled reference state. That's not a problem here like it was in ADAPT uh, BQE Gibbs because we're not going to choose the same uh, operator pool. We're instead going to find a so-called mixer pool consisting only of operators which are capable of entangling ancilla and data systems. So there are no operators local to the uh, data system. And so we, we can avoid getting stuck in this maximally entangled condition. The first operator in our mixer pool here is rather special. This is exactly the operator that Wu and Shea use in their approach. And so if we sort of restrict our mixer pool to only this first operator, we would be uh, 
basically reproducing their approach. But instead, we also include various other entangling operators, namely all two qubit operators, which are acting on both the data and Ancilla systems. And then we're going to iteratively construct our onsots, uh, not one operator at a time, but in a uh, QAOA-like layered structure applying two operators at a time. So the first operator that we apply is always the same. It's essentially time evolution under the problem Hamiltonian for both the Ancilla and data systems. HA here being the problem Hamiltonian applied to the Ancilla system and HD being the same Hamiltonian applied to the data system. And then the second operator that we choose will be one of the, uh, one of the operators from our mixer. In particular, the operator from our mixer, which maximizes the gradient of our objective function uh, with the initial parameter for that new operator being chosen at zero, just like in ADAPT BQE. And the operator for our, uh, for our uh, time evolution um, basically being chosen randomly up front. So at the very beginning of our algorithm, we choose some random value. Um, and we stick with that always as the first uh, value for computing these gradients. And then once we've chosen the operator with the larger gradients, we re-optimize all of the parameters, including this gamma parameter here, uh, to try to reach the uh, Gibbs state. Once again, we're making some sort of random choice in how we initialize our ansatsa uh, in this gamma. So again, it's possible that we make a sort of poor choice in gamma but also, again, uh, what we can do is just repeat this procedure for several different initializations of gamma um, and then post select the, the best performing onsets to actually reach the Gibbs state, just as we do in ADAPT QAOA. And so, what we find uh, using this different approach is that we can converge to the Gibbs state with uh, in excess of 99% fidelity relative to the exact. Um, uh, at basically all temperatures with, with, uh, within ND over two layers. So the number of layers that we actually have to apply scales sort of linearly with the number of qubits in our data system. This is uh, exactly the same as what Wu and Shea found. And so uh, generically, this seems that this onsets requires at least order ND squared C naughts uh, to reach high fidelities. However, as I've mentioned before, this approach uses much fewer operators at large temperature. So over here, we see that um, the results, basically uh, the, the final fidelity that we're able to achieve after optimization for various temperatures. And we see that at very high temperatures, we're able to reach uh, in excess of 99% fidelity uh, very quickly. At the highest temperatures I'm showing here, uh, 2.6 and 3, we're able to reach in excess of 99% fidelity in only a single layer. So. Uh, meanwhile, down here, we had the number of CNOTs required to actually perform these onsatsa, um, basically to reach the, the number of CNOTs required to reach 99% uh, fidelity. The dashed line, once again, is the number of CNOTs required in Wu and Shea's approach, this time uh, not just at low temperatures, but also at, at higher temperatures. And what we see is that for most of these results, we are basically acting in lockstep. Um, in these cases, our onsets procedure actually reproduces Wu and Shea's approach. It always chooses this single qubit operator, indicating that for many of these um, points, the, uh, the number of uh, basically Wu and Shea's approach is sort of most optimal in terms of what operators we can reproduce using this pool. However, occasionally, very occasionally, these uh, low numbers of, of qubits, but occasionally, we we're able to realize some operator savings by choosing other operators in the pool. And so uh, ADAPT QAOA Gibbs is able to find some, uh, some level of improvement over Wu and Shea's approach occasionally. And in the cases where it's not, we have sort of more of a, a assurance that Wu and Shea's approach is sort of best um, in terms of this QAOA-like structure. Uh, of course, this comes at the expense of measurements, but we expect that at larger system sizes, these savings will become much larger. Uh, these are, again, very small systems because of the difficulty required in simulating. And so this, uh, this approach converges uh, at faster at high T than our um, ADAPT BQE Gibbs procedure um, at the expense of using more complicated operators. But at larger temperatures, that sort of uh, those two effects uh, more than cancel out, and we're able to see quite a considerable resource savings in terms of the CNOTs that we're using. 
So uh, moving on from these procedures, I mentioned earlier that we have some potential issues with our objective function, namely the exact objective function that we've been using for all of the prayer results uh, requires a priori knowledge of the exact state that we're trying to prepare, making its measurement sort of infeasible um, because we, we, we don't know the initial state, um, the actual final state that we're trying to reach. But what we found is that instead, we can approximate this Gibbs state uh, by Taylor expanding and then truncating that expansion, the, uh, the exponential operator that the Gibbs state is defined in terms of. So for low truncation order, this is actually a horrible uh, way of approximating the Gibbs state. It doesn't even really um, generically uh, give us a state which, uh, it doesn't even generically give us a, a mixed state. It, it sort of gives us some more general uh, Hermitian operator. But what we found numerically is that these low truncation orders are still uh, very effective objective functions for Gibbs state preparation. So here again, we have uh, ND equals four results for periodic Ising Hamiltonian and the periodic XY Hamiltonian. These results are both for adapt BQE Gibbs, but we have similar results for uh, adapt QAOA Gibbs. And what we see is that at very low truncation orders, so sort of truncating at the very first operator, we're getting pretty poor fidelities. We're getting infidelities in excess of 10% on occasion. So we're doing a pretty bad job there, but it doesn't require uh, much further uh, truncation orders. You know, at, at, at uh, order three, we see pretty considerable improvement. And at least for these small problems, by the time we've reached uh, order five truncation, we're basically on par with the full uh, untruncated Hamiltonian or untruncated uh, Gibbs state. So these, these uh, low, uh, low truncation orders still provide a uh, objective function, which is very effective for Gibbs state preparation. But uh, these truncation, these truncated objective functions now require only measuring, again, the state purity, which is fairly easy to measure, as well as expectation values of the first few powers of the Hamiltonian. So this is obviously more expensive than measuring the Hamiltonian itself, but it's still just measurement of uh, some expectation value of some Hermitian operator, which is quite a bit easier than measuring the expectation value relative to some state, which we don't know how to compute just yet. Uh, so this does appear to be a very effective procedure for uh, generating Gibbs states. So just to sort of uh, conclude and summarize everything for the Gibbs state preparation, we have found that adapt, uh, adaptive variational quantum algorithms are in fact a viable route to uh, less expensive Gibbs state preparation, as well as uh, known results for ground state preparation of, for instance, molecular systems. And sort of more uh, even more excitingly, we found that the, the Gibbs free energy is not uh, the only suitable objective function for high fidelity um, Gibbs state preparation, even at intermediate and high temperatures. There are still a number of, of things that we need to investigate moving forward. Uh, for instance, so far, all of the results I've shown because of the difficulty on simulating on classical hardware are, are very small systems, only like four to six uh, data system qubits. Um, it, it's it's you know, interesting to ask whether this procedure will still work as well uh, for larger, more complicated systems. Um, these are also all spin systems, so not the sort of molecular systems that would probably be more interesting for molecular simulations. Uh, another big thing that's missing from our current analysis is analysis of the actual scaling of the measurements that we need to perform. So we saw that a uh, fairly low truncation order is, is very effective for these small systems, but it's unclear that that will remain true for larger systems. Uh, and so uh, moving forward, we do need to see uh, what the scaling will be for measuring the objective function and its gradients for larger, more realistic systems that would be difficult to simulate classically. There are also numerous um, sort of improvements that we could make on this procedure. So currently, you know, adapt VQE Gibbs in particular requires this uh, partially entangled state, which I mentioned uh, that our procedure here works fairly well in general, we found, but it maybe isn't the most uh, effective way of starting out, the cheapest way of starting out. So it would be good to investigate if there are any sort of cheaper initial states that we could use. 
And also the pools that we've been using are very permissive. They include, you know, for adaptive EQE of Gibbs in particular, they include all uh, one and two qubit operators, which uh, is, is very good for finding short ansatze, but means that we're doing many, many measurements for each iterative step. We have to measure the gradients associated with each operator in the pool. So it would be nice to see if there are any pools which can be uh, used that, that reduce the number of measurements we have to do with each iterative step. And then finally, I just want to thank all of the various collaborators at our group at Virginia Tech who uh, made all of this work possible. And with that, I will uh, thank you and open up to any questions. Thank you, Ada, for this very nice talk. Uh, is there any question first on uh, Zoom? Maybe there are no question on Zoom apparently. Questions from the audience? So careful about the. Your nice talk. I have a question, a technical one concerning the um, qubit adapts. When you when you realize this approach. I never understood uh, how it works. If, for example, you want to target a specific number of electrons in the system, is it something that you restore at some point or you include in a cost function during your optimization? Because, I mean, with uh, the regular ADAPT, you use uh, some, some operator in a pool that preserves the number of particles. But with qubit ADAPT, is it something that is also like included? Yeah, so uh, this is something that I didn't um, mention, but yes, there is, there is work concerning that because you're right, for these, uh, for these sort of the simplest um, uh, poly-based uh, pools, there is no guarantee that we're preserving symmetries for anything, uh, for our original Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. um, and that's especially problematic because if we are in the correct symmetry subspace, any uh, operator which does not preserve those symmetries will necessarily have zero gradient, which can cause us to get stuck very early, as well as uh, potentially moving us outside of the desired um, subspace were we to choose those operators, which can make things less efficient. However, it has been shown, first of all, that there is a uh, so there are so-called minimal complete pools, basically pools that um, uh, consist of as few operators as possible required to stay within our desired subspace. So we have a uh, lower bound proved on um, the, the size of pools required, but sort of more excitingly, uh, there are uh, procedures that we found for generating um, pools which do actually preserve the symmetries required. And so that work was uh, shown by a graduate student, Vlad Skolnikov in, uh, let's see if I have the paper. Okay, so it, the first paper here that I've shown um, starts on that um, sort of route. There is another one that goes into more depth, especially regarding these symmetry preserving pools. I can get you the reference for that if, you, if you're interested. But uh, yeah, so there are, there are procedures for choosing these uh, hardware efficient pally based pools that still preserve those symmetries. Okay, thanks. Ready? Uh, thank you for the great talk. So it's always interesting to see uh, the adapt free QE. So my question would be, uh, so many of these calculations have been done on uh, state vector simulations, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, do, you, do you have any uh, feeling on how noise will be, for instance, gradients, which is uh, very sensitive to? Yeah, so there have been um, simulations on, on sort of noisy systems, particularly with regard to uh, how they affect things like barren plateaus, because in that case, you know, the, the noise can really just uh, swamp the gradients and make things rather difficult. Um, so that really is ongoing work. We're still sort of seeing how that behaves, but particularly for these uh, control VQE uh, type uh, simulations, there actually is work going on right now, um, basically testing how these procedures work on real hardware uh, in like, like the uh, IBM chips that's being done, so. Yeah, that, that would have been my, my follow-up question. Has it been applied anywhere? Because the measurements blow up pretty harshly, yeah. no? Yeah, so we, um, that's, that's ongoing work. We don't have very many results on that yet, but yeah, we have a, a graduate student currently working on uh, implementing this control DQ on real hardware. And, and then for the general ADAPT, uh, is there a feeling how it scales? like uh, with number of qubits going up 
Is it log n? Is it n? Is it n squared? Yeah, so I don't know that we have a, a good sense of scaling to large systems yet. Um, but we do sort of have the feeling that, you know, because of this sort of, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This, this uh, uh, sort of gradient descent like approach that we're taking to choosing the operators, um, that it, it's sort of uh, very efficient in choosing the number of operators required. It's sort of an open question uh, in general, BQEs, how um, these procedures scale, sort of how, how, whether even there's even any quantum advantage once you get to very large systems. Uh, yeah, uh, it was not so much about quantum advantage, but for instance, you, you see CSD, you know that you're, you're having uh, N squared, uh, like depth at least. Sure. Or, uh, yeah, I mean, we expect because of the operator pools, it probably does at least as well as UCCSD. Um, but I don't think that we know much about um, precisely how it scales for adapt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Um, and I have, um, so it's a, let's say, a question on your opinion, whether based on your experience with uh, adapt VQE, variational algorithms can or cannot work like Michelle was advocating. So what would be your personal take on the, on the topic? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I think that to get to larger systems, we're going to need pretty considerable improvement on sort of noise and noise mitigation. There are obviously quite a few uh, groups working on that. I'm not really sure how well ultimately the uh, VQE procedures will work in this very noisy era, um, but I think there is a lot of potential there. Um, these are sort of one of the, the best uh, applic the, one of the best algorithms um, for these noisy simulation approaches. And in particular, what is your take on? Because some people who don't really believe in variational algorithms will tell you. Maybe you should do quantum imaginary time evolution. That's something that is usually well, quite often put forward. What, what would be your, your opinion on this? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are exciting results with uh, kite type algorithms. Um, but adapt VQE does seem to do it particularly well, especially for these control VQE type approaches where we're really sort of moving into um, qubit control type problems we're able to see very considerable improvement on the type uh, gate times required to realize Gibbs states. I mean, or um, sorry, uh, molecular ground states. I mean, we saw, you know, for lithium hydride, which is a fairly small problem, but, you know, as we, we would expect that larger problems, this would become even more severe with the circuit model. You know, we've, we're getting sort of three orders of magnitude improvement on the coherence times required. So I think this really is a viable approach, even considered uh, compared to things like kite algorithms. Thanks. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. <laughs> um, my question was about the Gibbs state preparation. So uh, it seems a bit different with respect to a traditional uh, VQE approach because you need ancillas, right? Yes. So you need the, with respect to the size that you would normally use, you need to double that size. Yes, generically, especially at high temperatures. Okay, so, so I was wondering, how this compare because I've seen that the uh, Gibbs state pre prepared uh, at least in theoretical paper. I don't I don't even know if it was simulated using quantum signal processing. So I don't know if you know about uh, it's it's basically we need uh, some block encoding so uh, a number of um, of qubits. Uh, uh, as that goes as the logarithm of the um, number of terms in the Hamiltonian. Uh, but of course, it needs a lot of controlled operation, the determination of nonlinear phases, and they approximate the Gibbs state. Here you are measuring. There, basically, there is a probabilistic um, preparation of the state. And uh, yeah, and it needs a lot of controlled operation, but it seems that it's uh, it's uh, it needs less than C less qubits. Sure. So, um, uh, I was wondering if you have an idea on how the two compare, and uh, 
why you would consider your uh, because I have not fully understood what the ANSIL has do in uh, in your approach. So, um... right. So I think one of the main benefits of this procedure, this sort of variational preparation over something like that, um, what you're describing is is more of like a, a random sampling where you're preparing these states and and when you sample many times, you're approaching sort of sampling of the Gibbs state. However, the Ancilla system here is essentially acting as a purification of the actual mixed state. Um, it, it allows you to purify the mixed state that you're trying to prepare. So you're not just preparing something that when sampled many times gives you Gibbs state-like results, you are deterministically preparing the Gibbs state itself when you uh, restrict your uh, attention to just the data system. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so you're doing and, a deterministic pure state preparation rather than some probabilistic. Yeah, yeah. It is probabilistic in the sense that it depends. You create the state depending on what you measure on the ancillary. Sure. So it's uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, just I like. The key point I would say is that uh, you have these Antilla qubits, but you know, I mean, they effectively make the system open. So I'm measuring them, you create an effective, and if you then think about it, that it is already open, then of course it becomes complicated because the open part is controllable in your case because you have qubits. And, and then if you consider the decoherence that is there, it's not so well controllable. But now this is basically what you could do instead of adding Antilla qubits to make it open. To try to consider the noise that is already there. All right, thank you. That's that's essentially what I was trying to say. Uh, stated better. So yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Well, if not, I think it's now time for lunch, and we can thank, of course, Adawaran again. For the nice so lunch is uh, upstairs. Well, normally you have uh, your badge also. Some of you uh, 